Whenever the history of Lagos State is told, the story of the ancient town of Ekpe cannot be omitted. Ekpe became a focal point for international diplomacy when it became the home to the exiled King Kusoko, who was expelled from Lagos State by the British Army. The town housed the first post office in Nigeria, the second older seaport, the second police station in the country, the first comprehensive college in Lagos State, among others. Now, despite its rich heritage and contribution to Lagos' economy, the town, once a fast-growing model city, now stands on a depleting economy, further worsened by environmental issues. Hello and welcome to another edition of Ecosphere. I am Mary Kanu. Now, as a call to action, we see two artists and photographers, Balaji Alonge and Shola Otori, who have taken it upon themselves to bring to the fore the plight of Ekpe residents with the aid of artworks and video documentaries to launch a campaign tagged Greener Pastures. Ekpe lies on the left bank of the coastal Lagos Lagoon with rich aquatic life. As beautiful as the scenery may be, the experiences of residents in this part of Lagos State is a direct opposite. The freshwater ecosystem is threatened by the spread of a highly troublesome aquatic weed water hyacinth, which is impacting biodiversity and the economy. <laughs> We are highlighting the beauty of the place and also how to get sustainable living for the people living in these communities. As you know, I tell stories using my, my, my pictures, my photography, but we are inspired here by the beauty in the first place, the beauty of this place, the sheer grandiose of the greenery of this place. But now looking at it closely, you see that things have to be done to make the lives of the people better. So that alone inspires me to do this, for us to be able to present it to you and talk about it. Yes, water hyacinth has been a problem. And you know, water hyacinth grows exponentially. If you wake up today, it's grown like in three folds. So we need to be able to do something with it, create a pathway for the people, especially to be able to go through it and back. They use small boats make life easier for the people living in this place and also work on water resources, education and healthcare. What we intend to achieve with this is the clarion call. We are calling out now. So the first step is for them to come in and then see and then from there create, uh, make the healthcare system work, put water there, let them drink water let them have health care, let the kids be able to go to school. Then uh, from there, you can't even tell the things that would happen. Let there be electricity in, in all of these places. To start with, even Oriba, a place that already has poles and poles of uh, electricity and wires on them, but no light. Let these things kick start. It, it, you know, it, there's a chain reaction that follows. So we are at the beginning of this chain, creating this ripple effect and then um, we intend, we hope the government would come in to do what they are supposed to do. Besides creating awareness with our works or through our you know, mediums, photography, film and video, uh, painting, we want to reach out to everybody that is concerned uh, to create sustainable solutions, you know, not apart from creating healthcare, water, uh, uh, education, we also would like other people that are concerned to either sponsor workshops wherein um, somebody that can um, train these villagers how to convert this problem into a positive uh, result, into a solution, you know. So, for example, you would, if you look around, you would find some crafts, some beautiful marketable crafts here that are made from water hyacinths and other kind of seaweeds. 
So these are some of the things that we are looking to achieve in the near future. Fishing is a major source of livelihood for Ekpe residents and the waterway is a major means of transportation for them. The infestation of this floating plant has made navigation difficult for residents and the ripple effect on their daily life is enormous. As far as the eye can see, water hyacinth creates the sensation of endless green fields peppered with brilliant lilac flowers. But these seaweeds have taken over the Lagos Lagoon, carrying along with them so much waste indiscriminately dumped, which affects fishing and water transportation. Uh, water has is a big obstacle to navigation, to smooth navigation. Secondly, they need to fish. You cannot put your nets beside water hyacinths because the waters will break all the nets. So it comes like as a lot of additional economic burden for these people. If they cannot navigate, we cannot fish. Then, of course, you know that the economic, the money they're probably going to get from the fishing is going to be limited. Now, what has it comes also with all sorts of parasites growing underneath it. Since these people drink this water, they're going to pick those parasites and then um, quite a lot of diseases that were ascribed to demon may actually be one of the products of those parasites have been connected to them. So essentially, proper control of that seaweed will be so necessary for these people um, if they have to have a quality life or a semblance of quality life. So Sometimes Sometimes Taba Mam will me a car be or cock across the other side. That will look more old me, borehole. Keep cross the other side, your man do you call water hyacinth? Taba Mam cross. If by me, I know more merely law, could you allow three hours? New unit, you, you could do twenty minutes. Tea le bashu won, a fun. Mosquito, Mamma Jawan. Especially to je pe mi faint ka to le de jin a de ti ro gbon da si di wakati ijoba na la yin oju e ma ma won agbalagba wa ton ba ti dagba die to tutu ba ti mu won ati bi won do hospital nu wahala ni wahala ni emi to je pe irin hospital ti o je ko ju 10 minutes or 15 minutes to je pe o bili ke nu La Malo, Catholic be one day hospital, a me at the dark. Catu dome. Ekpe as a nation town in the early days meant that commercial activity was concerned with numerous developments and infrastructures, but the reverse is the case as life has stopped in the tracks for residents. As you see from the documentary, it's a very beautiful place. This is a place everyone from this part of Lagos could always go and enjoy nature and come back. So that would help the economy of this place. Fishing happens there a lot. So these people actually feed us here. So if things are better there, fishing here, food, and for, for, for us here, agriculture from there, it would be better. So I think it would be a lot better if everything, this ripple effect I'm talking about, if everybody is in on it, all the agencies involved, if they are in on it, Results will be achieved, definitely. Ojeo mo ikorodu. Mo wa si bi bala ti wa se ise apeja. Tori o ma peja nlu. Tori e mo ko se mechanic. Mo ni dowo tori pe ise ti mo ko mo be ra rin ise. 
the best she freedom. To him, we was silly, that's why wa wo that wa sise osa ko ti mo ri bayi ni pe bi bayi bo se wa ko si inu nbe won so school to de wa bi bayi na kere ko ti si teacher pupo ni be ko si teacher pupo n bi bayi school to wa bi bayi me ke won in textbook to ma fun oni igbo oyin won gbe wa si bi bayi fun won student mo ni bi bayi ko de ti wa su titi ko tu si omi ko tu si anything bo o yi sise won bo to wa ni gbo ko si ni bi bayi so on cotton te wa ni bi bayi ni when you listen to the dominant narration in the news and newspaper or television and print media and whatever media it's essentially on what's happening in the city and all that stuff but why are we not having a beat dedicated to this critical rural people because that sort of, that kind of place will be the place to absorb the excesses of lagos population let's get it straight lagos population is going to add blue and those are the kind of the last um, frontier to absorb those population challenge. That's the frontier we need to push agriculture, push tourism, push um, sustainable living, uh, you know, uh, climate change. Because again, when the climate change comes, it will hit them first and hit them hardest because they, they are not protected. Oliva, for instance, is the is the voting capital for the second world. There's a river where there's a river killing world. I'm talking, it's, let's begin from politics. Um, now, if you count all the votes in a quite division, and if you don't see that of a river, you're wasting your time. Now, because of that, you see a lot of political politicians going to this place. I remember, was this at Ibo, one of those villages, mm -hmm. when the chief had to go and bring for us an old wall clock that one politician gives us. After giving this wall clock, they walked away. And there's nothing for us again. So they felt that this will only come when they need votes. Um, and then they said they, they, they were very, they felt despondent. What really can be done to help the residents of Ekbe Town? Who knows? But we'll take a break here. And when we return, we'll be speaking to an environmentalist on ways to help restore the lost glory of Ekbe Town. Please stay with us. Corruption not in my country. Caught. All right. What's your name again? Kemi? Yes, sir. Good. Are you ready for us for next week? Yes, sir. Next. Do one, sir. Do one. What? Look, what we need here is one who can speak fluent English. Give her a chance. I need a angel to hold me. Hold me, my beautiful angel. Cut! It is angel, not angel. Please, I'm done with you. Excuse us. Kemi was far better. It's not about her rendition. It's not about her performance here. By the time she and her friends join us in our hotel room, <laughs> you will know how far. Can I have her phone? She has a robust profile. She's a real robust profile. I do not undercut professional ethics. It is an act of corruption. Not in my country. Corruption not in my country. Stop corruption now. Welcome back. You're still watching Ecosphere and today our attention is on the historic Egbert town, now a shadow of its former self as a result of a seaweed water high scent, which is an environmental threat to Egbert residents. I'm now being joined on the program by John Ekoko, who is an environmentalist and is also quite familiar with Egbert town. Thank you for joining me on the program. Now, the historic Ekpe town was once a collecting point for the export of fish. Now, looking back at uh, Ekpe then and now, what do you know about Ekpe? And uh, uh, what are your thoughts on the current state of the town? Yeah, um, thank you very much. Um, Ekpe is a historic town. And one of the five divisions that make up Lagos State. When... Um, the military boys came in 1966. However, as with other areas in Nigeria, Ekpe has not fared too well. It was um, a postal town. Now, recently, till about 40 years ago, thereabout, till about 20 years ago, it was known as a coastal fishing town. And it had a very large fishing market. 
which is busy almost every day of the week. And most of the indigenous of Epe are into fishing business. It's either they are fishermen catching the fish, or they are fish sellers selling the fish. Most of the men catch the fish, while the women sell the fish. And until the late 80s and early 90s, when the water ice in, infiltrated that um, coastal area, fishing was the main economic activity that Ekwe was known for. In fact, Ekwe has what I can call an international fishing market. We are not only other areas of Lagos, other states in Nigeria, even up to Ndo, but up to neighboring West African countries come to buy fish. However, when water ice and came, both the quality of the cash and the quantity fell drastically. What we have today is a shadow of what used to be the Ekpe main fishing market. Amber Day is an indigenous of Ekpe town. When he was governor, he tried to give Ekpe town a facelift. He even promised to help them modernize the fishing markets. However, as he lost the second term bid, you can as well kiss bye bye to the dream that the market will, will, uh, will get the uplift. So, what do we have? Equa is back in its steady march of you know, non development. If you go to the market today, it's a shadow of itself. In fact, the traders, they say they don't know any other occupation. So they just go there, they sit down instead of staying at home. And they virtually moan until they go back in the evening. Definitely, a prayer is in need of urgent intervention. Uh, we are well aware of the growth of the seaweed, uh, causing environmental issues for residents. Now, what do you know about the seaweed, the water high scent? And uh, uh, let me ask, why and how is the beautiful plant a menace to a pair residents? Thank you, Mary. The water high scent invasive plant came into Nigeria in 1984 landed in Lagos and started to spread. It spread to Ogun, spread to Ondo, and virtually took over the whole of the, uh, you know, coastal uh, waters. And because of the nature of plant that it is, it reproduces so fast because it reproduces sexually and asexually. And one of the things that has aided the spread of the water I sent is the pollution that goes into the waters. Particularly these hydro pollutions, either diesel, petrol, then this chemical pollution from maybe the cotton, um, textile industries, a few other chemical um, factories that empty or that discharge into the water. These pollutants create a very conducive environment. And don't forget, we're in the tropical region. So with the right temperature, the right humidity, and with the pollution, and of course the flow of water, the water I sent, spreads very rapidly. And honestly, if you know the rate of growth of water I sent, you'll be shocked. It can grow up to, it can cover 600 hectares within three months. And you see, when it does so, because of the unique feature 
on top of the water, the leaf doesn't have much weight. It floats. The root under the water can survive very well in the environment, in the habitat that it has created for itself. It drives other plants away. And by so doing, it blocks the total waterway. Now, I must ask, um, is, is, do you think uh, there is a lasting solution to the growth of the seaweed? And um, is there a positive side to the growth of the water hyacinth? Talking about tackling water hyacinth, like other organisms of its type, there are three main methods. There are the physical method, which the government embarked on since around September 2020. The problem with the fiscal method is that it does not actually address the root cause of the water ice, ice and growth and spread. It's, I mean, and it causes fatigue. You can use dredgers, you can use uh, uh, combined machines, um, a like combination of them. So like I from the physical method, which involves going there with uh, dredgers, harvesters, and labor to clear the water ice from the water body. There are also the biological methods by which certain insects and organisms are introduced that infest the water ice and kills it. The problem with the second method is that it's a long-term method. It is cheaper. Another problem is that non-target um, things in the environment can also be affected. The same thing for the chemical method. You can use certain chemicals to actually uh, kill off the water ice. But the problem is that the chemicals may also affect other habitats in the environment. And of course, you cannot do it once and get a complete treatment. To try to repeat it continuously can be very expensive. Another thing that can be done is to study the growth pattern of the water ice and use a control method to gradually weed off the water ice from the waters. Right? So, if you do that, maybe for short term, you use the fiscal method. The medium term, you can use the chemical method while you are relying more on the biological method for the long term. Now, looking at the positive side of the water ice I've named so many. You can produce anti-pollutants with water hyacinth that can be used in pharmaceutical industry, used in chemical industry, used in textile industry. I know textiles, pharmaceuticals, and all that, they are down. But one thing I know is that the ones existing, they import. Water hyacinth will not be sold because it, it has a nuisance value today. If they can get this product from there, it will be cheap. The other industries can actually buy it. Water hyacinth can be used to make, like I said, um, fabrics, board products. It can be used to make paper products. It can be used to do so many things that in the interim, before they clear it, a whole set of industries can spring up from evacuating water ice and from the waters. Now, uh, um, let me ask, uh, uh, finally, before I let you go, aside from the growth of the seaweed, um, it generally seems like the town has been abandoned by the government. Um, the people lack clean water and the overall well-being of residents is threatened. Now, what do you think can be done to restore the last glory of the town? Thank you. That of a pet town 
is easy. You have to modernize the payment market because it is like the main artifact from the town. If it is done, it can even become a tourist attraction. There are other signposts there that people will be interested in going there to see. The market is a shadow of itself. In fact, it's a no-no. Yes, Amber, they did some work on roads, but sadly it stopped in the main town. The roads must be made to go interland a bit more. Because roads open up areas, we know that. I think the people should try to get Laswa to open a center there, if possible. Or make an arrangement with Laswa, how they can also join the, uh, um, what do we call it now? Is it an intervention program? For communities affected by water I sent. Well, environmentalist John Ekoko, thank you for joining me on the program. Thank you for your contributions. Well, on that note, we have come to the end of today's edition of the program. Many thanks for watching. I'm Mary Kanu. Bye for now. <laughs>